everybody, my name is Ixi and welcome back to my channel where I analyze Nine Inch Nails music. And today we're going to be looking at the music theory behind La Mer and the La Mer theme, which kind of weaves through the fragile and even extends into other albums. It's such a strangely confusing but beautiful piece of music. And so we're going to talk about why that is. This video is going to get really, really nerdy, so you have been warned. So I want to start by analyzing the rhythms. This theme. has a 3-4 time signature, three quarter notes per measure, otherwise known as a waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three. For the piano up here, we have one, two, and three, and one, two, and three, and one, meaning we have one quarter note and then eighth notes. The bass line, which is a stand-up bass being plucked, it's just hitting the downbeats. One, two, three, one, two, Three. So you could say, well, the whole song is in 3-4. And you could, up until the part where the drums come in. The drums are in a 4-4 four, four time signature, four quarter notes per measure. So there's one more beat in each measure. So is the song in 3-4 or is it in 4-4? Four, four? It's both in 3-4 and in 4-4. Four, four. The harmony is moving in 3 and the drums are moving in four. So that's really disconcerting. When you listen, you might be kind of feeling it in three and then you feel it in four and then you kind of go back and forth. It can be difficult to really feel them both at the same time, but it's possible. And that's sort of a strange experience, but that's gonna translate really nicely into our discussion of the harmony. Now, the drums come in at a really unexpected time. The phrase, meaning this whole sequence that I just played, is eight measures long. The drums come in on measure four. They just sort of barge their way in in. in fact, it doesn't even just start on the fourth measure. There's a kind of a pickup on the last beat, tuck, tuck, sort of a drum fill leading us in. So not only does it feel like the dream was interrupted, but the drums themselves feel interrupted. They're not even coming in on the beginning of their phrase. Does that make sense? It's the last thing I would have expected. I didn't particularly enjoy being jolted out of this beautiful dream. So there are four things that we're going to be analyzing. The thirds. plucked bass line, the bass guitar, and the melody. La Mer is the most confusing Nine Inch Nails song that I've analyzed so far. To the point where answering the question, what key is this in, was much more challenging than I expected. If you're not too familiar with the word key, what I mean is the tonal center. It's where things feel the most at home, where they feel the most stable and settled. And all of the notes and chords and intervals are in relationship to that tonal center. It's where all the notes eventually really want to return to. So that's why I call it home. It anchors us, but it also gives context for all of the harmony that's happening. So what happens when a song doesn't have a key, when it doesn't have a tonal center, when it doesn't have home? It feels unhinged, like you're floating, like you literally have left the planet. So starting with the thirds. So there are three different thirds here. The lowest one is a major third. The middle one is a major third and the uppermost one is a minor third. And they're moving in a stepwise motion, meaning they're one note apart. If I just take out the top note, sounds like I'm going up a scale, right? Now there's something kind of unusual about these thirds next to each other. If I just play them and leave the sustain pedal on so I can kind of hear all the harmonies together, I get this feeling like it's really open and almost like floaty and dreamy. And usually what that indicates is that there are lots of whole steps. Whole steps sound like this. That is the whole tone scale that's been used in film scores to describe outer space before, because it just feels completely, like I said before, unhinged. Where are we going? hear this. So that's giving that sort of floaty feeling, but there's another thing that's giving it a little bit of an unusual quality, and that's this tritone. Tritones are the most unstable interval that exists in Western tuning. Some would call it ugly, but Trent makes them very, very beautiful. So I just kind of hear this ringing out. Even though we're just playing thirds, there's sort of this ghost of the tritone. If I just play this, 
you, you would have no idea what key I was in, I think. Now, those thirds don't really have any meaning unless they have context. If I put this note underneath them, they mean something different than when I put this note underneath them. I've got some clues that this is in C mixolydian. C mixolydian is like C major, but with one note changed. Your C major. And C mixolydian. The note that changed is the second to last note, the seventh degree. So in a major scale, it's raised. In mixolydian, it's flat. And this adds a completely different quality to it. So these thirds would fit into the C mixolydian scale. Another clue is that into the void is in C and it uses the same exact intervals in the same part of the octaves. So there's another context for this, where it's definitely in C. So you could say, okay, well then, case closed, it's C, it's in C mixolydian, what's the deal? Even if it's in C, can we really argue that it's in C mixolydian when this is the baseline? Let me go ahead and play the C mixolydian scale again, and then I'm gonna play that baseline in the same register, meaning the same octave, so you can really hear the differences. do not sound the same. This plucked bass line has a flat three, whereas mixolydian has a raised three, and this bass line has a flat six, while mixolydian has a raised sixth. Another thing that makes me question the C mixolydian designation is that this bass line starts on B flat and ends on B flat. briefly touches C for just one measure. But Trent Reznor is not afraid of minor sevenths, this B flat being a minor seventh. He writes melodies around them. He leans into them. He emphasizes them. He builds chords off of them. He starts melodies on them. He starts chord progressions on them. So this is really not that unusual for him. It might be for another musician, but not Trent. He likes to start us off in this really sort of unresolved way. He makes us anticipate the resolution. When you play it kind of fast, it almost sounds like a pentatonic scale. The F minor pentatonic scale to be exact. Forget what I said about the F minor pentatonic for a second. Let's just assume we're still in C. The bass line doesn't necessarily have to follow the scale degrees. You can borrow chords from other scales and it adds a lot of drama and that's something that Trent does all the time. So I'm gonna go ahead and build a chord on top of all of these bass line notes to give us more context for the harmony. And they're gonna be triads, a major or minor triad. A triad is two thirds stacked on top of each other. One third, another third. Now let me play these triads for you with my left hand while I play the thirds with my right. That sounds like a very strange melody and a strange bass line, but it does sound like it's in C. And this chord, and this chord would just be borrowed from a different scale. Now, you might have noticed some dissonance. And what I mean by that is notes that are just, mm, they don't sound great. They sound really abrasive. Like take this chord. In fact, there's dissonance in just the bass line alone. Let me play it for you again.
right there. So this E flat, which is one of the notes that doesn't belong in C mixolydian, one of the borrowed chords, is clashing with every single one of these thirds. Now it's not being played like with every third, it's just the beginning. And it's down here. So with all that space, it's a lot more easy to hear them on top of each other because they're literally not on top of each other. He is not changing this pattern in any way to accommodate the chords he's borrowing from other scales. He's very aware of the dissonance and the tension and the ugliness and the anxiety that this creates for his listeners. So this was not an accident. He could have changed it to match the chords. For example, probably not gonna like this. That little motif would have fit better over the bass line. Better, meaning less dissonance, uh, makes more sense with Western tonal harmony, etc. But I really admire how bold he is. He's just like, I know that this is ugly, but it's beautiful. So you get clashing with, with this as well. Once again, we've got this minor third. This little chromatic motion. But essentially what's happening is fits very nicely in with the plucked bass line, but doesn't fit so well with this. Okay, but remember, there's a whole other world up here being played by what I think is a dulcitone, something that's been sort of detuned or maybe it's broken. And one way you can tell for sure is if you try to play along with a piano or a perfectly tuned guitar or whatever instrument you have, you will hear that you are not in tune with it. That instrument is introducing microtones into the whole mixture. So I'm not gonna go into that much further. I know that Jacob Collier likes to talk about microtones and I think he's gonna help kind of bring them more into the forefront because normally microtones are sort of reserved for uh, diff completely different tuning systems, different parts of the world. Our ears are not used to those intervals. Anything microtonal is going to sound out of tune to us. And Trent knows that it's out of tune. This is another way that he's making us uncomfortable, but he's also lulling us with the beautiful tinkliness. Of so let's check this out against C. That sounds very pretty, that sounds fine, but do you feel like you're home? Because I don't. If I were just to hear the melody by itself with no context at all, nothing else, I guess that it's an F major. Okay, so this is starting to get even more confusing now because the bass line kind of reminds me of F minor pentatonic. This melody seems to fit really well over F major. So is it in some kind of F actually? To test that theory, I'm going to play those same triads that I built off of those bass notes with this melody on top. I could make an argument for this being an F. So I'm gonna do a little experiment. I'm gonna rearrange this chord progression to sort of emphasize and anchor us in F more. And we're gonna see if this sounds homey. 
kind of makes sense. But if you add all of the other things back in, then this feels like home. Let's go look at what happens in We're In This Together. At the end of We're In This Together, you get a theme very similar to La Mer in a different key, different rhythm, but still hearkening back to La Mer. It's really more a premonition. If we transpose these thirds down to here, then what would the bass line be? That would put us in G. So we can't really use we're in this together as any indication about what key it's in because the context for these thirds and we're in this together is completely different. These thirds sound like they're borrowed from the end of We're In This Together. So what key is this in? Well, I'll tell you something, it's not straightforward. Whew. Okay, so after all that, what is my conclusion? What key is this in? Just like it's in 3-4 and in 4-4, I think it's both in C and in F. At least that's how I experience it. That's part of why it sounds so weird to me because we've got under here with and this on top. It sounds like it's an F to me. Academically though, you would probably make an argument that it's in C. C question mark dot 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 wink but at least now we have a better understanding of why it feels like we're floating in the ocean quick side note the name of this track was inspired by the Debussy piece also called La Mer I did listen to it a little bit and I couldn't really hear any resemblance uh, harmonically but I know that that's something that Trent was thinking about and I read in an interview that Trent was at a beach house I think and he was trying to write music and the only song he was able to write was La Mer. But what was really happening for him personally was that he was contemplating suicide. And maybe if someone had never heard this song before, they might say, this doesn't sound like any kind of suicidal song. It's so, so pretty. But it's not just so, so pretty. There's so much dissonance. There's so much that doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. And then you have these kind of assaulting drums just coming in the middle of nowhere. That is not pleasant. You might groove to it. You might like it. You might be like, this is cool. But when it comes down to it, this has been a ballad that has been abruptly interrupted. And there are lyrics. It's spoken in Creole French. And this is what she's saying. And when the day arrives, I'll return to the sky and I'll return to the sea and the sea will embrace me and deliver me home. Nothing can stop me now. There are a couple other harmonic elements that come into La Mer after the drum beat starts. There's an ebo on the guitar, which is a really cool magical little device that sustains the note. And it's mostly playing D. Wow, would I went up like that? It sounded just like, just like you imagined. <laughs> it's just leaning on the D, which is the second degree, feels very suspended and very unresolved. And it doesn't resolve, but it does go up to G kind of. Reznor's sense of harmony is so unique. And the very end, he kind of adds in a third, just like in, just like you imagined, with the very ending where he saves the third or the 10th for last.
which is just another gentle way of giving us a sense of satisfaction at the very, very end. No real chords have been played. Remember I was playing these chords? He's not playing those chords, just playing a bass line, which is a signature Trent move. In some ways, these thirds, this is kind of unusual for him. Like I haven't really heard anything like this. And when I first heard La Mer, I didn't know it was Nine Inch Nails and I would never have guessed it was. I didn't know what it was. Up until that point, all I had heard was the downward spiral and the hits from Pretty Hate Machine on the radio. So I hadn't really heard a whole lot of his piano stuff anyway, but also I just never heard something like this. So I wanna do a full analysis of wearing this together and into the void. But I will say that in We're In This Together, it really sounds like an afterthought. Into the Void, however, it's a foundational part of that song to the point where it sounds like he took this one idea, he took it one direction, and then he took it a completely different direction. That is the bass line of Into the Void. That's the end of this video. If you watch the whole thing, you're a hero. Bye.